All right. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Um, if you are here to learn how you can bring ho wolves home to Colorado, you are in the right place. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening um, to learn how you can help restore the balance to the Western Slope. Uh, my name is Valerie. I'm the Deputy Organizing Director at Ignite Change. And uh, for those of you who are not already familiar, Ignite Change is the Center for Biological Diversity's Rass Roots Activist Network. Um, and we're dedicated to defending wildlife and wild lands. We believe in a life-centered world where people respect wildlife, wild lands, clean air and water, and protect the planet's rich biodiversity. Wolves are clearly a critical part of that. So we launched our Call of the Wild campaign nationally in January to fight Trump's proposed plan to strip uh, Endangered Species Act protections from wolves. And since then, we've mobilized nearly a thousand volunteers across the country to go out into their community, to gather comments, to educate people on wolves. Um, and together with our allies, it's been the largest demonstration of opposition to an en Endangered Species Act issue ever on the national scale. So we're proud of that effort, um, but we are really excited to kick up our efforts a notch and go on the offense in Colorado. So we are working with Rocky Mountain Wolf Action Fund to bring wolves back to Colorado where they belong. Before we get started, uh, I just wanted to go over a couple of tech tips. So one um, thing you, if you haven't discovered it already, is the chat box. So uh, if you're on the Zoom app at the bottom of your screen, if you go to like kind of hover over the bottom of your screen, a few icons should pop up. One of them is a chat box, which I'm going to chat to everybody right now. Hello and welcome. So you should see that pop up. Um, and please feel free to use that chat box to introduce yourselves, you know, say where you're calling in from, um, just a good place to connect. The other feature is the Q&A button. So same place on your screen if you're in the Zoom app, it should pop up um, when you hover, hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen and there's a little Q&A button. And that is the best place to put questions. If you put it in the chat, sometimes they get lost, but we will have a, about 20 minutes at the end for question and answers. That said, I really do encourage you to hold on to your questions until the end because they may get answered in the course of um, our call before we get to Q&A. So at that point, please put your questions in the Q&A um, section and we will get to as many as we can. Uh, I think that's it on tech. Oh, I will, oh, one more thing, if you called in, so if you are not using the Zoom app on your phone or computer um, and you dialed in, you won't see some of these features. Um, you won't necessarily see the slides, but we will make sure that you get all the information afterward um, and make sure that the experience works for you in just audio, um, but I believe yeah, most of you should be able to, should be in the Zoom app and get the full experience. Okay, I am here tonight with uh, two of my co-presenters. So to be transparent, we are having a little technical issue with uh, one of our main presenters. So we're trying to get his audio squared away. In the meantime, um, I'm going to introduce Ben, who is uh, the Rocky Mountain Wolf Project Action Petition Director and Project Manager for Landslide Political. Ben? Thank you, Valerie. I, I'm so happy to be here with everybody tonight. Um, as Valerie said, I'm heading up the petition effort here in Colorado. I work with Landslide Political. We're the firm that has been hired to collect uh, um, petitions, and, and we do this sort of work uh, all over the Mountain West. Um, uh, in Utah and Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and elsewhere just in the last uh, year or so here. Um, so I've had some really great success so far. Uh, we just received the paper petitions on Monday night and happy to say that we've already collected over a thousand signatures. So 
moving really quickly here, and uh, I can imagine it'll get um, only only better uh, once we have uh, all of your help uh, circulating these petitions to everybody in the state. All right, excellent. Um, and I just saw Heidi you said, can you put in headphones? I put in headphones. I'm not sure if that uh, helps your audio, but Ben, for you, is my audio coming through a clear right now? Yeah, okay. Okay, so Heidi, apologies if that doesn't fix it um, for, for you, but hopefully folks, most folks can, can hear me. Oh, Heidi says sounds good, excellent. Um, all right, so uh, it looks like our, our staff expert, Michael, is, has not made it back with audio yet. Um, so I think we'll proceed uh, and hope that he is on soon. I know you probably can relate to technical difficulties, um, but I do hope he can join us because he is uh, an expert in this issue. Um, oh, did we get it? No, not yet. Okay. Um, so when he gets on, Michael is a senior conservation advocate for the center who lives in Mexican gray wolf country in New Mexico now, um, but who led the previous effort to reintroduce wolves in Colorado from 1991 through 1996. So he has a deep history with this, um, and I know he's really excited to see this effort now underway with the ballot initiative. So what's going to happen on this call? Um, fingers crossed, Michael is going to give us a rundown of the ballot initiative, what it would do, why it matters. Um, ben is going to go over the timeline and what we need to get this done. Um, and he's going to give a pretty detailed run through and training of everything that you need to know to start gathering signatures. I'm going to ask you to step up and sign up tonight to join this historic effort. Um, and officially, you know, sign up to gather signatures, and then we're going to have Q&A. So this call will go about an hour, um, so it should be plenty of time in between the end of our call and for folks to get chips and guac and go watch the debates tonight if you would like. Um, so with that, um, I was going to pass it to Michael. I'm wondering, Ben, if you might be able to step up and give us a little more context about the ballot initiative um, on the spot. Sorry, I'm muting myself there. Yeah. Um, Valerie, do you want me to go into the you know, training portion here, the signature collection stuff? Um, not yet. I think giving a little more context is good. And actually, I can start us off just with some broad context while um, Michael figures out his audio. And then, yeah, either he'll hop on or we can get into the more detailed stuff in a minute. Um, but just, just as larger context. So, um, and many of you may already know this. This is maybe why you're on. But this is why we're here. So we know wolves once roamed through the Rocky Mountains. Um, and tragically, the howl went silent in 1945 when the last native wolf in Colorado was trapped and killed in a government-funded extermination program. Um, that obviously was happening across the US at this time. Um, but, but in Colorado, it was devastating. And since then, the landscapes have deteriorated in the absent, absence of these magnificent predators that help keep the landscape balanced. Um, and we, this includes Michael in his efforts, have, um, have been working literally for decades towards wolf recovery in, and reintroduction in Colorado. So I, I know from talking from, to him and others in Colorado um, that uh, it has become abundantly clear that no one is coming to make this happen from the government, right? So U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, many of you know this, on the national scale is trying to strip endangered species protections from wolves from coast to coast. Um, and that all but completely undermines and shirks their duty of actually finishing the job, uh, which 
all the major scientists have come out in independent reviews and otherwise uh, to say, you know, this, this proposal to strip Endangered Species Act protections from wolves doesn't make sense because the job is not done. And one of the critical pieces, one can argue, of where the job is not done is in Colorado. So it's abundantly clear the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is not going to come and finish the job on their own. Um, I know that there have been multiple efforts to get bills passed in the Colorado legislature that have not been successful. Um, so it really comes down to, to we the people, the people of Colorado, to make this happen. And that's where there, there is this historic opportunity of this ballot initiative. Number, what is it, 107, Ben? 107. 107, the magic number, um, 107. And uh, you might be able to talk a little bit more about specifically what the bill would do, but it, it's basically a voter mandate for wolf recovery, wolf reintroduction, um, and a wolf recovery plan. And I know that it doesn't lay out all the specifics of how, how that will happen and entrust the state agencies to actually come up with that plan, but it is like this has to happen by, what date is it, Ben? Uh, 2022. 2022. So it's a voter mandate. This must happen by 2022. Um, some of the details can get figured out later, but, you know, we are we are handing you a mandate to make it happen. No more delaying, no more excuses. Um, the good news is that there is broad support uh, if we can just get organized. So a poll uh, for Colorado voters stated that 69% um, of voters indicated that, quote, a vibrant wolf population would be an asset to Colorado. And 72% indicated that wolves were, quote, an essential part of the wild habitat. Uh, so, again, quote, we should encourage an increase in their numbers in the region. So we have support. Um, that's why we're convinced that the best and really only path forward right now is to pass, get this on the ballot and pass this ballot initiative to hand the governor a voter mandate that requires reintroduction and recovery. Um, let's see, the ballot initiative. Ah, here's the, it seems like this is the exact wording of the ballot initiative. So basically what it says is, um, shall there be a change? This is the, the question to the voters. So shall there be a change to the Colorado revised statutes concerning the restoration of gray wolves through their reintroduction on federal public lands in Colorado, located west of the Continental Divide, and in connection therewithin, therewith, requiring the Parks and Wildlife Commission, after holding statewide hearings and using scientific data, to implement a plan to restore and manage gray wolves, and requiring the commission to fairly compensate owners for losses of livestock caused by gray wolves. Question. So that's like many of these, you know, legalese, um, a very long run on sentence, but essentially, as I said, it's a voter mandate towards wolf reintroduction and recovery. Um, and I'm actually going to paste that in this chat in case folks want to read exactly what it says. Um, but really, the the main lesson here is this is this is a make or break moment for wolf recovery in Colorado. It's been a long time coming. Decades of work have been paving the way for this moment. And we have the support we need. This could be our, our last, but really our best chance to make this happen in our lifetimes. So let's not miss it. Okay. Um, so to get wolf restoration on the November 2020 ballot, we need to collect 200,000 signatures. That's total. We need 125 valid signatures. And, um, and it will be a mix of paid signature gatherers and volunteer, but we really can't do it without the volunteer portion. And I believe the goal is 60,000 signatures gathered by volunteers. 
Um, so that's where you come in. That's where we really need you to get this on the ballot. Um, of course, after that, there's a whole fight to pass it, but first things first, we need to get it on the ballot. So Ben is gonna go over the nitty gritty, just how to, um, uh, making sure that there are a lot of steps and, and, and um, things that you need to know as a signature gatherer. Our goal is actually to have you be able to leave tonight being ready and knowing everything you need to to start gathering signatures. Um, so we're gonna get to that in, the, in a minute, but I wanna take this first opportunity to share the link to sign up. So if you already are sure, and I hope you are, I just shared it in the chat, that you wanna be a part of this historic effort, please click the link in the chat, or for those of you on the phone, it is bringbackthemissinghowl.org. Again, bringbackthemissinghowl.org. Click it, sign up, um, and sign up on there right now. That'll ensure that we know, hey, you wanna volunteer, we will follow up with you with all the information that you need, next steps, a guide, a how-to guide, materials, et cetera, et cetera. So please sign up. We'll have another chance to do it at the end. Um, but we really need you to make this happen. So thank you again. Um, I'm going to pass it, assuming Michael's audio is still not working. Um, I'm Hi, I think we figured out a way. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, okay. Is you want to give it a try? Yeah, let's try it. Okay, I'm gonna share quickly and he's gonna go through my audio. Okay, <laughs> creativity, problem solving. We make it happen. <laughs> this is Michael Robinson. I, I hope that our work through is working at this point. Uh, and I apologize to everybody uh, about the, the frustration. Uh, I wanna just very briefly give uh, a little bit of the background of this very exciting initiative. Uh, and I apologize if I cover stuff that Valerie has already covered because I was unable to hear anything of what she was saying. Um, wolves, of course, used to be throughout Colorado and, and throughout the lower 48 states and the North American continent. Uh, when their natural prey, such as deer and elk and moose and bison and bighorn sheep, were killed off by uh, settlers who weren't thinking of the consequences in the long term in an era before game limits, uh, the wolves turned towards livestock, which had replaced them very quickly on the landscape. This is in the late 19th and early 20th century. Bounties funded by counties and stockmen's associations and the state of Colorado failed to reduce significantly the number of wolves, uh, and stockmen became very frustrated, naturally enough, and they turned to the federal government. This was happening all over the West, and they asked the U.S. government to initiate a wolf extermination program, which began in 1915 by funding by Congress. The last wild uh, native born in the United States wolf in, in the lower 48 states was probably killed in Colorado in 1945. If one thinks about it, 1915 was near the beginning of World War, and it took three decades and the end of another world war until wolves were completely exterminated, three decades of federal effort. They were killed by federal employees using traps and poison and digging up the dens of wolves and then killing the pups. Uh, it was not a conservation program, it was explicitly an extermination program. And the effects on the ecosystems of Colorado have been profound. Uh, we're now learning how wolves interact with their ecosystems from research in Yellowstone National Park, for example. Uh, wolves provide carrion for scavenger animals like bears and eagles, wolverines, and a whole host of others. Uh, wolverines, of course, are a highly imperiled species of which there may or may not be any in Colorado at the moment. Uh, wolves keep their prey animals moving around rather than being sedentary and doing a lot of localized damage to vegetation, for example, in stream sides. And so we've had changes to the morphology of streams and their functioning throughout Colorado uh, as the, the herbivores, whether they're elk or deer, or as, well, as well as cattle, I have to mention, uh, have, have impacted areas severely. And that impacts fish and birds and amphibians and all kinds of creatures that depend on the habitats. Uh, I worked in the 1990s uh, to try and get 
uh, support for Wolf Reintroduction. We got tremendous support. I was in Colorado at the time. Uh, we even got a federal investigation funded by Congress of the feasibility of reintroduction because originally the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said there was no room for wolves in Colorado after the investigation that Congress authorized uh, was completed. They, they found that there's room for over a thousand wolves just in western Colorado alone. Um, but there was no, no uh, movement by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to reintroduce this endangered species in Colorado. They focused instead on Yellowstone National Park and central Idaho and western Montana, which are all very important places for wolves. And we're very glad they were reintroduced into the northern Rocky Mountains. Um, but that doesn't help our habitats in the southern Rocky Mountains in Colorado. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, extend the wolf's range um, very, very far. What we need to do for real recovery is ensure that there's wolves in connected populations in much, if not all, of the remaining good habitat in the lower 38 states. I live now in southern New Mexico uh, near the habitat of the Mexican gray wolf that used to be connected uh, by, by wolves of various different populations or subspecies, one can classify them as one wishes, uh, all the way through the southern Rocky Mountains in Colorado and up to the northern Rocky Mountains. And reestablishing a population of wolves in Colorado uh, would, resume, would, would restore some of the, that old connectivity and the gradations in wolf types from the very small Mexican gray wolves to the much larger wolves in the northern Rockies and, of course, further north in Canada and, and in Alaska. The livestock industry that was the political impetus for removing wolves is still very opposed. And so the initiative uh, that's now going forward, if we can collect enough signatures, uh, would bypass the Fish and Wildlife Service, the federal agency that really has been overly responsive to the people who don't like wolves in, in the livestock industry primarily, and would just make it a state of Colorado goal. Uh, and it would require wolf reintroduction. Well, first of all, it would uh, re require you know, Colorado Parks and Wildlife to develop a plan with public input and public hearings. Uh, and it plan would have to be science-based. And it would uh, require implementation of the plan, actually getting the wolves on the ground in western Colorado uh, by the end of December 2023. That's a brief summary of what it does. Um, but what we're talking about is, uh, is more than just, you know, the act of putting wolves there. It's an act of restoration. It's, an, it's also an act, in my view, of atonement for our, our society's very unwise and brutal and merciless killing off of wolves and all the damage that, that has been done. And it's a statement that people in Colorado are ready to, to live with wolves. Nobody is suggesting that it will be a particularly, you know, uh, that will always be easy, uh, but clearly we're capable of, of living with a wide variety of wildlife, whether it's black bears or mountain lions or rattlesnakes, um, and people know how to adapt, people know how to put their garbage away, not everybody, of course, and this is a step that, uh, that I think that we're ready for. Uh, what we need is to get it on the ballot. There's, there's going to be a lot of opposition, and um, I'm hoping that some of the people listening now will be willing to step up and, and spend some some time talking to neighbors and friends and strangers uh, at, at uh, malls and anywhere else and support Absolutely. the introduction uh, back, uh, well, getting it on the ballot and support getting the wolves back. Thank you so much, Michael. I didn't suppose I can actually hear them. <laughs> yes. Glad you could glad you could get on and share some of your wisdom. I, I apologize for the, the poor sound quality. Um, Again, technical difficulties, we'll iron it out for, for next time. But um, at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Ben. He's going to go over really the nitty gritties of uh, gathering signatures, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Thank you, Valerie, and, and thank you, Michael. Um, so happy again to be here with you all tonight, and uh, I'm just going to take a second to um, switch my screen over here. And can you let me know if this looks correct? In just a second. How are we doing? Yep, I can see it. Good. Okay, great. Um, 
So thanks. Uh, I think I said a little bit before about um, our firm and what we do as far as uh, you know, collecting petition signatures for um, progressive causes across the Mountain West. Um, I'm the lead on the project. Uh, my name is Ben Tobias, and uh, we've hired regional leadership. Uh, we're in the process of bringing on board uh, additional volunteer coordinators who are going to become the points of contact for um, circulators like you all across the state. Um, we're prepared to work with you, you know, right away. Uh, so any contact that you, that you uh, you know are looking to have with us right away, we're we're here. We're available. Um, for anybody um, away from the areas that I mentioned of uh, you know, Boulder, Denver, and Colorado Springs, um, we can work with you by mail um, and, and by email. Um, we've got a, a, a post office box that I can, uh, that, that uh, actually I believe Valerie will share with the team here, um, where uh, we can receive uh, petitions that we mail out to you. So uh, this is truly going to be a statewide effort in that way. Um, just to give you a quick rundown of where our regional offices are located here. Um, I'm sorry, I'm seeing that. Sorry, uh, yeah, are you still seeing my screen share, Valerie? Yep, I am. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, in Boulder, um, we're in the east part of town, um, 3012 Sterling Circle, Suite 200. Um, that office is open beginning tomorrow. Um, we would uh, ask that you, if you're if you're looking to come visit the office in Boulder, come by around 6 p.m. tomorrow. Um, same in uh, Denver and Colorado Springs. Uh, we're at 2700 Arapahoe Street. That's just 27th Arapahoe, north of downtown in the Curtis Park neighborhood. Uh, we are open and fully staffed there and have been for about a week. Uh, and just this evening, and you guys are the first to hear, we've uh, opened our Colorado Springs office uh, in 22 and 24 East Los Angeles Street again, um, pretty close to downtown um, Colorado Springs there. So um, we are open for business and uh, going to continue to ramp things up from here uh, after just receiving those petitions on, on Monday night. Um, so... Um, just want to run through quickly and um, give you what the requirements are uh, to be a circulator and then uh, the requirements of how you must conduct yourself uh, while circulating. The state of Colorado has a pretty stringent and strong set of laws uh, on uh, signature circulation. Uh, there's a robust industry of uh, you know, lawyers who uh, you know, make their living by uh, you know, guiding challenges to, to signature efforts and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so we have to be really vigilant that we're doing everything uh, exactly by the book at all times. Um, we're, you know, uh, feeling like we're in a you know, pretty good position right now with how we've been set up so far that um, it's going to be really easy for you to do that out in the field. But we do, of course, you know, run through each, each of the rules um, with you, uh, you know, about uh, the requirements that must be met to be able to uh, circulate and then uh, the actual act of circulating. So just to start here. Um, the requirements to be a volunteer circulator. Um, quick, sorry, quick inter intervening, I guess. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm still seeing the first slide, so. The first uh, slide. Yeah. Um, I figure you're on probably slide. Or yeah, I've, slid, I've, I've gotten through a couple, I'm sorry. Um, okay. How's this? It's still on the first, still but the um, first. I can actually... Do you want me to do the screen share? That'd be fabulous. Okay, I'll take yep. that off the plate. Okay, um, um, here we go. So we can go to slide four, if that works. Okay. There, you seeing that? Okay. Um, yes, I am. Okay, thanks. Um, if anybody out there is having a trouble, you know, reading this, um, I'm happy to send this presentation on a PDF afterwards, or you can raise your hand in the chat right now. Um, but um, just to jump back in, the requirements to be a uh, volunteer circulator, and this is you know, for any petition in the state of Colorado. Uh, first, you must be a citizen of the United States, and you must be at least 18 years old. Uh, you have to have a Colorado residential address. Um, it, it uh, should be permanent or temporary. Um, some, some place you can receive mail. Um, you do not necessarily have to be a permanent Colorado resident or registered to vote here. Um, just have to uh, meet those requirements of, of uh, ha having an address. 
Uh, you must wear a lanyard, uh, name tag, sticker, or button, but it, it must say the words volunteer circulator on it. And we do have stickers available in our offices, um, credentials that we can pass out to, but uh, certainly encourage you to, um, you know, homebrew this one if you like. Um, you know, anything, you know, where, where that's presented uh, is, is fine. Um, so after being trained and before circulating, we also need you to um, initial sign an email or text us, um, you know, a, a scan of a, an agreement that we put together, the circulator do's and don'ts agreement that outlines um, that you understand what the laws are around petition circulation. Um, and, and we actually have to have that on file before we can uh, hand out or mail to you, um, you know, a packet of signatures for you to, to circulate. Um, I see, uh, I see the chat here. Uh, I will uh, send around my email um, uh, right after the training. Thanks. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Was that too many? Um, no, I think this is the next one. Slide five. Yeah. Let me double check. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Cool. Great. So um, here's where we go over, you know, some of the uh, real serious stuff about signature collecting. And, uh, you know, uh, by telling you this, of course, I uh, understand that none of you would ever consider doing uh, many of the, you know, foolish things that are listed on this page. But just to read them off to you so that we're completely uh, you know, out there with every requirement of, uh, you know, whatever goofy things you can't uh, legally do. Uh, you may not bribe, pay directly or indirectly, or, or promise anything of value to somebody. That, that means, you know, no stickers, no, um, you know, literature, you know, maybe handed out in exchange for a signature, any, anything at all like that, um, uh, you know, can't be, you know, exchanged for somebody signing um, a petition. Uh, don't even joke about it includes joking around. People may be recording us out there. Um, you know, we do expect there to be a, uh, you know, concerted opposition to this ballot measure. And, uh, you know, if they um, are really active uh, early on, it'll be, you know, somewhat covert. So uh, one of the safe things to do is just assume that, uh, you know, that, that your interaction, uh, you know, could become public. And so you're just conducting yourself in, uh, you know, the, the best possible way. Um, there could be no forging of any signature. Uh, you can't change a date of a signing or change anything that is written on a piece of paper, um, uh, you know, that, that a voter signs. Um, you can't, you know, pay or use any other person to circulate petitions on your behalf. Um, we'll, we'll hand you a packet of 40 um, petition signatures to, to, to get filled out. And uh, they all must be, you know, witnessed by you. So you, nobody else can, you know, share your packet. It's yours. Uh, and at the end, you'll sign with your, uh, your name and information uh, stating uh, as much. Um, you may only ask for and accept the signature of a person who, um, to the best of your knowledge, is registered to vote in Colorado. Uh, one of the things that uh, you might ask while you're out there circulating is, are you registered to vote in Colorado? Uh, if somebody says yes, uh, you know, you're good to go. That's completely above board there. Um, plenty of folks, you know, may say yes and, and sign anyway. That's not necessarily, uh, you know, the issue that we're dealing with here, but um, if they say no, uh, obviously we just move on. Um, you can't seek or add any signatures to a petition section after you sign uh, the affidavit at the end of it um, and have it notarized, right? So uh, that's a process where um, unless you're, uh, you know, in an outlying area or far away from one of our offices, you know, we'll be handing the notar handling the notarization if you, uh, if you hand it in, uh, in an office, but otherwise, um, you know, we'll ask you to, you know, have a packet notarized, uh, you know, at a, at a local bank or somebody, you know, maybe a notary, whatever that might look like. Um, and then, you know, uh, overarching here, just to close this slide out, you know, while gathering signatures, you must personally witness every signature collected on a petition packet, and it's not sufficient that you're just present in the same room or vicinity. Uh, so, you know, you can't leave that on a table while you're at an event, uh, uh, you know, or, or anything, you know, like that at all. It has to be in your hand, and if you hand it over to somebody, you should be standing there watching them sign it. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, these are all legal requirements laid out by uh, statute and by the Secretary of State's office, and so, we have to uh, we have to stick to them very closely. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, 
Great. Uh, so uh, rules for people who are signing the petition now. So when you're, when you're out there uh, talking to folks, approaching them and saying, hey, uh, would you sign my petition to reintroduce gray wolves into Colorado's wilderness? Uh, you, you can uh, go over, you know, just a couple portions. And all this is, uh, you know, out, outlined in the, in the packet itself. But uh, each signer must be registered to vote in the state of Colorado. Um, they should read the warning that appears at the top of each page of the petition and given the chance to review anything uh, that's in the petition. The full ballot measure is printed in there. Uh, information about the uh, proponents of the ballot measure is, is included. Um, and they must be allowed to you know, peruse it and, and, and view every portion of the document if they so choose, um, although they don't have to. Um, but yeah, they should read the warning that appears at the top of each page. Uh, they should uh, print clearly. It must be blue or black ink. Um, anything that's not blue or black will mess with the counting machines at the Secretary of State's uh, public facility. Um, they must complete each portion of the signature line with all required information, and we, we will see that in just a second. Um, and they must use the name they used when they registered to vote. So, you know, Michael, not Mike. Um, the residence and, and you know, the address where they're, where they're registered to vote is also um, what's required. Uh, or there is a risk of uh, not being able to match that signature to an individual and it might be thrown out. Um, so no signer of the petition may sign for another person. So, you know, uh, so somebody who, you know, says, oh, I'd like to sign for my husband as well. He wants to sign this. Husband has to be present, uh, you know, to, to additionally sign it. And, or, you know, nobody can do it for their friend, uh, you know, partner or anything like that. Um, nobody should sign the same petition more than once. Um, you know, it's not legal jeopardy for a signer here on any of these pieces, but um, the second signature uh, won't count. Um, and and it you know mess with our um, uh, you know verification process a bit. Uh, you know, if, if somebody says they've already signed before, we just move on. Um, no ditto marks to provide information on a signature line. So if you do find uh, folks who are you know signing you know partners who live at the same address or something like that, um, who are you know providing the same uh, address information or whatever, they must they must write it out. Um, there may be no PO boxes and. Uh, uh, nobody may sign a petition that's already been notarized. So um, once it's notarized, the uh, you know, petition uh, is closed out. We can go to the to the next slide now, Valerie. How am I on time here? <laughs> doing okay? Uh, yeah, you're doing good. Maybe Great. like five more minutes. Sure, I think that's about all we'll need. Um, so yeah, here we're seeing um, what the uh, what what the box uh, where folks are signing, um, you know, sort of looks like. Um, if there's a small mistake, uh, you, you can see here, we've got to, you know, um, the residence address is listed and uh, somebody has messed up the apartment name. Um, so that person uh, should cross out the incorrect piece of information and replace it with um, that which is correct and, and write their initials right, that, right there. So we've got EE for eligible elector um, in, in this instance here. So. Uh, initialing to fix is okay. They shouldn't jump down to a new signature line um, unless it's uh, you know pretty substantial mistake, right? Uh, they've listed you know um, a, a, an entire box wrong or, or something like that, and then uh, you know at that time you can ask them to just uh, cross it out and, uh, and and fill out the the, uh, the next set of boxes down. Um, so we can, we can jump to the next one. Great. Uh, so there's some uh, set, there's a set of rules for assisting um, disabled or uh, folks who are illiterate and still want to assign the uh, sign the petition. Um, if a registered elector is physically disabled or illiterate and they want to sign the petition, um, they may do so by uh, signing their name or making their mark in the signature area. And any person except the circulator can assist that person in completing the remaining required information. So. Uh, if there's somebody else nearby, uh, that's, you know, you're going to want to grab them, pull them in and just say, hey, um, this person I'm, I'm speaking with here uh, is, is trying to sign my uh, you know, petition to reintroduce gray wolves into Colorado. Um, would you please assist them? But you have to find an independent um, you know, third party uh, to assist in the event that um, you are working with somebody who uh, is unable to sign of their own accord. Um, but the circulator may not do that themselves, and that's a that's a real particular rule to just you know again keep uh, any circulator from um, putting marks to a page here 
that they are circulating themselves. Um, and, and I think that's pretty straightforward. We can move to the next one too. Great, so rules for when you finish a petition packet. Um, we give you a, a booklet of, uh, with, with 40 spaces for folks to sign. Uh, and when uh, uh, you fill up, uh, you know, one, two, three, ten of those, and it's time to, uh, you know, bring them back to the office for, for notarization or to your local, you know, bank, um, bank branch or whatever it might be for, for notarization. Uh, we just, there's, there's a couple rules we observe when, when it's being handed in to, to make sure that's, uh, uh, you know, fully valid, um, real legal document acceptable to uh, the, the state statute standards. So um, you, you can't sign the petition affidavit except in front of a notary. So there's a whole affidavit on the back where you include your personal information, um, your um, address where you're registered to vote, all, all the same sorts of things that, uh, uh, that we're asking of our, of our signers. Um, you should have a proper ID at the time of that notarization, uh, the first time that you are having petitions notarized with that person. A driver's license, passport, state-issued ID card uh, is going to be your best bet there. Um, so a notary will ask to uh, see your identification to make sure everything is you know, completely official. Even if we know you the first time, um, it's just a requirement for, uh, for a notary, uh, for a, notary, a notarization to be valid, uh, that we do see that. Um, um, all management staff in our regional offices are notaries, uh, so there will always be somebody in the office who can help if you are returning petitions to one of our offices. But if you're not near a regional office, and I think I've mentioned this a couple times, you can use a local notary public. You may know somebody. All banks have notaries um, that they uh, will typically make available to uh, the public for free. Um, and we'd also just like to have the business card of the notary included if you're mailing petitions back to us. So that we can just uh, you know, paper clip that on um, to uh, you know to uh, you know a packet that you've returned. Um, not the end of the world if you're not able to get it, or if you're working with somebody who doesn't have a handy business card. But uh, it's nice to have. Um, once notarized, you can uh, you can mail that completed petition packet and, and the notary's business card to the campaign PO box. Valerie again will circulate that in a bit. Um, it's here in Denver, uh, right down the street from our office. Um, and again, you may not add or, or, or seek to add any signature to a petition after you sign the affidavit and have it notarized, it's closed, it's done. That's it. Um, so uh, just a couple of things to add on affidavit corrections. If you make a small mistake on your affidavit, just like somebody um, who makes a uh, mistake on a petition a signature, um, you can correct it just by crossing it out and initialing that correction. Um, and the notary can only correct a mistake made by the notary, and the circulator should only co correct uh, any mistake made by the circulator. So um, basically, it, you know, it's just uh, owning your portion, any part where your name goes onto it, um, you know, whether that's um, signatory, uh, you know, circulator, or, or a notary, the person just has to correct an initial mistake themselves. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. And then, yeah, just uh, uh, that's the rules right there. Uh, you know, it's uh, pretty straightforward, but always happy to answer any question um, that folks have about it. Um, so there's some some great practices for, uh, you know, for, for circulating as well and for having success while you're, you know, um, pursuing signatures in the field. Um, for signature gathering in a location, you want to just make sure and approach everyone that you possibly can with just a really positive attitude quick smile, a direct pitch. Um, 30 seconds or less is the goal, but in my opinion, 30 seconds is even a little too long. Um, I think you can get out in 10 to 20 words. I would just start out something there like, hey, I'm uh, petitioning uh, the state of Colorado to reintroduce the population of gray wolves into our wilderness. Will you sign? Um, I, I'd avoid uh, using language that's like, uh, excuse me, do you have a minute of your time for wolves or whatever? Just approach and be direct about what you're doing. Um, you know, folks get these sorts of solicitations for all sorts of things. And, um, you know, I, I live in Denver and I, I routinely see folks raising money for all sorts of causes at like my local grocery store and things like that. And they're doing great work. Um, it's, it's not always possible to engage uh, every time for everybody though. So um, it, I think it's more likely if you're direct about what you're doing to make a very quick ask 
uh, to the person that's walking by and to every person that you possibly can as they're walking by, you're going to have more success and get more signatures. Um, again, you know, the second point there is something we've already been over, which is just that you have to have um, a name tag or a lanyard with the words volunteer circulator on it, stickers, buttons, anything like that is fine. Um, we're not going to debate with people who disagree with us and um, you know, we haven't actually seen a ton of that yet, uh, which is very nice. Incredibly positive reception for all the, all the uh, uh, petition circulators who've been out in the field so far. But, you know, if, if somebody is, uh, you know, not interested or, or, uh, wants to debate or disagrees with what we're doing. Um, we're just going to keep those unproductive, unproductive interactions as brief as we can. Um, again, we're asking every person that we you know, that we see that we possibly can to to sign the petition, um, and then quickly verifying that they meet the requirements we've gone over. Eye contact is always a good uh, uh, you know, way to go about it. Um, people are not going to come to you if you sit behind a table as frequently as if you're standing. Uh, you know, in front of that table or something like that. There may be a situation, you know, perhaps um, you know, you're, you're at your local farmer's market or something like that, or, or you know, a, a public library uh, is letting you circulate, but they um, you know, require that you have a table. Those would be the, uh, you know, exceptions. But even then, I would try to stand out in front of a, of a table, um, but just being mobile, moving around and going to people so that you could ask more of them to sign the petition uh, is always the best and always going to get more signatures. Um, and yeah, that goes along with the final point here, which is just, if you're in a large area, you just got to go where the people are. Um, you might see, you know, a crowd of people on a corner across from you. If you're, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, across the street from them or something, you're just going to want to go ahead and cross the street, go over by them, spend some time on that corner and then move to where the next group of people are. If you're, you know, say in a crowded downtown area or something like that. Um, so hopefully that's all uh, you know, pretty intuitive and, and makes sense for everybody. Um, would love to hear, uh, you know, have a conversation going forward about um, your successes and uh, you know, the ways that you're able to collect the, you know, the most signatures and that you feel uh, things you know, are going uh, the best for you. So um, I think that is the final slide, unless there's one more. Valerie? Oh, I stopped the Great. slide. I think there was a... One more. I think it's uh, in review. But it was, yeah, it was kind of next steps, one of them, which was virtual mm -hmm. trainings we're doing right now. So, right. Great. So, yeah, no, we're, we're, uh, we're set then. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Well, let's, let's take some questions here. We have some great questions. Um, and yeah, if you've been holding out to ask them, now's your chance. So, again, the QA uh, button is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'm going to share my email right now for everybody. Yeah, great. Oh, and I am also going to share this um, sign up link one more time in the chat here. Uh, if you didn't see it already, it is Zach the Missing Howl. We just got that URL last night. So, um, .org. Bring back the Missing Howl.org. Make sure you sign up just so we know, like, okay. These are our folks. We're going to follow up with you so that you are supported every step of the way. Um, we have a guide, a how-to guide that walks through each step. Um, but let's let's clarify some questions that you may have right now. Um, one is, can we download Ben's written material? So um, I would say yes. Ben, is this something that we can share as a resource for folks? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, maybe the best idea would be I can just send around a, a PDF copy of these slides um, so that you can use them as guidance. Uh, you know, the full PowerPoint um, might be a little clunky for you, but uh, no problem at all for us to share this um, with you in, in the entirety. So. Excellent. So if you send that to me, I will also add it to the how-to guide so you kind of have everything in one place. Um, some of these guidelines are already in there, but just to have the full, some of those visuals were really helpful, you know, like the signature visuals and stuff. So I will make sure that the actual, um, all the content is linked in the guide. Um, next uh, is, ah, please post the hours and phone number of Boulder office. So mm -hmm. that would probably go for all of the offices. Again, Ben, if you get me that, that info. Um, I know we already have the addresses in our how-to guide, but might as well just add in the uh, hours and phone numbers there as well. 
Sure. Um, just uh, something I didn't mention during the training. Uh, we, we are hosting volunteer trainings in person um, on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays um, in each of the offices. The Tuesdays and Thursdays are occurring at 6 p.m. Uh, and the, um, uh, the Saturdays at 2 p.m. So that's for friends and family. As far as I'm concerned, uh, this serves as a training for anybody on here. So uh, no need for you to necessarily attend one of those, but um, we, will, uh, we will send around the hours as well uh, for each of the offices, and, as well as contact information for folks uh, who are in there, so. Okay. Um, and petition, can the petitioner bring along a gopher to round up signers and guide them to the petition? Yes. As long as it's, um, uh, you know, as long as the person who has the packet is, um, you know, in possession of the, their own packet that they are going to um, put their name on the affidavit for and have notarized as, you know, as, with them as the circulator. Um, you can totally have, uh, you know, somebody wrangling up people for you. I would go ahead and recommend that that wrangler also be a, uh, somebody who's carrying a packet of petitions and, and you know, has, has been trained by us. Um, you know, if you're able to get a, a large group of people going and you only have one packet with you or even two packets with you, um, sometimes that might create a situation where there's, you know, signatures being missed because people don't want to wait around. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're able to work strongly in a group like that, um, which is, you know, something that, you know, is, is a great advanced tactic that I'm sure, you know, most of you could jump right into, um, yeah, that's something we would absolutely encourage. So. Excellent. Yeah. Um, one thing to note, just because some folks on this call have been engaged with our network and we have like a map where you add your event, we invite people to join you. This is going to be a, a bit trickier with this campaign because whoever gathers signatures, like you have one packet and only you can gather signatures. So you can't invite volunteers and pass it around and share the collection um, in that way we will be following up with folks who are more experienced, um, who've been leaders in comment gathering. There will be a way um, that we can support you in being a trainer for others. So kind of hang tight for more info on that. Uh, but in the meantime, get your feet wet, make sure you get out there individually and practice and um, get good at signature gathering for this and then We'll follow up and um, allow you to kind of help bring in others within our network. So uh, next question, ah, please repeat your suggested interaction, Ben. Sure. Yeah, I, you know, the, the biggest thing that I say about this um, in terms of coming up with your opening line, introduction line is make it your own. Um, you have to find something that works for you and sounds like you and uh, that's the only way to be genuine and engaging with folks, which is the only way to get a lot of signatures. So, um, uh, you know, just to start it off, I'd say come up with something that works great for you. But the one that I would suggest using or that I've used is, hi, I'm circulating petitions to um, have Colorado reintroduce a population of gray wolves into our wilderness. Will you sign? Just bam, one sentence. Um, or two this, goes into the, this goes into the next question. Yeah. If I say, no, I hate wolves, and I start to get into a debate with right. you, how do you disengage? Uh, oh, okay, thank you for your time. And then, you know, if they're following you or want to talk more about it, um, just disengage. You know, there's, there's you, you say, you know, there's, I'm sorry, I've got a lot of other people I want to talk to here, uh, or no, I'm sorry, we disagree, whatever it might be. Um, but you know, genu genuinely, if you find somebody who's passionate enough about it to argue with you in this situation, it's not going to be something where any minds are changed. Uh, obviously, they're not going to change your mind, right? So you have to assume, uh, you know, it's the same on the other side and, and you know, move away from the person if need be. But it, again, it's just not something that happens very often. I've had zero reports of it um, so far. Um, and generally, you know, if, if people don't want to do it, they just won't sign and move on. But uh, just use very light, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for your opinion, things like that to, to you know, disengage and move away. I hope that's a good enough answer for folks. Nice, thank you. Um, okay, there are a few questions from Rose here. Um, will you share your slides with us? Mm -hmm. So the answer was yes, 
We will put those um, in the guide that we will send you in an email tomorrow. Um, next question, do you have someone on the Western Slope to help with circulators? And she says, I'm willing to use my home as a contact point for the Western Slope. Um, so maybe that, that question, there's one more as well, but um, how would that work then? Sure. Uh, so uh, our plan right now is, you know, we do have a long list of people um, kind of in a really wide geography all over the state, um, all over the Western Slope. Uh, I think we have, uh, you know, people from, you know, Craig to Durango uh, on the west side of, of things, and actually a lot of people in Durango, not surprisingly. Um, uh, you know, Grand Junction as well. Um, and, 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 you know, definitely, you know, in all of the mountain communities, I, I think we have one or two people who have, you know, signed up and are interested in doing this. And our plan so far has been it. Um, get petitions to those people by mail and also plan, uh, you know, a couple instances where we're uh, having staff swing through to uh, meet with a bunch of folks all at one time, um, you know, and, and get the, uh, you know, uh, sort of packets out to, to people that they need, all the materials that they need out there. Um, and uh, I see this is Rose asking this question. Rose, we'd absolutely love to connect. Uh, we are just, you know, a, a day or two into beginning to, you know, build our infrastructure here. And, you know, as soon as we have everything set up in Denver, Colorado Springs and Boulder in our offices, uh, you know, our, our attention is going to turn right away into, you know, engaging the rest of the state and figuring out how we, how we get that going. So uh, it's good to know that, that you're out there and, and willing to help us. And, uh, you know, certainly uh, think we could find a way to, uh, have your home be, uh, you know, a contact point. I would love to hear more about where you live and, and see where that is in relation to, uh, you know, a lot of the activists that, uh, you know, maybe in your community. Nice. Great. Yeah, I hope we can make that happen of some hubs in other areas of the state that don't have an office near them. Yeah. Um, and I also see in the chat, Val is also on the Western Slope. Val, if that's Val Walker. <laughs> I know you, you're one of our leaders, so thanks for being on. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can really connect up folks who are uh, in uh, different areas of the state. Okay, and then finally, just a couple final questions, and we're probably going to go about five minutes over just to wrap up these questions, um, make sure you feel set, but there are just a couple left, so thank you for hanging tight. And um, this one is, if two organizations collect a signature, will that thro throw out an entire packet? Sounds scary. Hope not. Um, so if somebody signs one packet and then signs another packet, no, it doesn't. It doesn't throw out an entire packet. The second signature won't count. Um, yeah. And we may think that uh, you know that it, that it, uh, that it is going to count uh, in our validation process. Um, you know, we do have some steps to eliminate duplicates and things like that. But um, that would be about the only downside. Uh, would be. Uh, for uh, for the for the second signature not count and us for you know, us to think that we have one more than we actually do, um, it's part of the reason that we're shooting for that two hundred thousand number uh, is uh, when, when only one hundred twenty four thousand are, are you know, the legal requirement to make the ballot is because things will happen where you know signatures don't count maybe a packet is thrown out for some reason or another trouble with an affidavit or a notary you know whatever it may be we just got to overshoot that number so that we um, so that we get there but ultimately. Uh, you know, if, if we have somebody who signs a packet twice, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to, you know, seriously harm the effort, um, if, unless it's happening on just an extremely large scale that is pretty unrealistic. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, okay. Last question here. Will the paid petition gatherers be knowledgeable about wolves? Um, and do they get any training in case they're answered? They're asking. Yeah. Yeah, so the difference between our, um, our paid training and, uh, and the training that you all just received um, is uh, 15 to 20 minutes on, uh, on wolves and, and the history of this movement uh, to reintroduction. Uh, paid folks are given, uh, excuse me, are given um, you know, flyers that they can sometimes offer to people. That they're given um, fact sheets uh, that they can reference while they're out there. And actually, um, with you know, knowing that we've had you know, wolves uh, and the Rocky Mountain Wolf, uh, you know, project kind of on the radar here for a while. A lot of the folks that we've worked with <laughs> have gotten really excited about it. And, uh, uh, you know, they're showing up to work and like fun, like wolf t-shirts and stuff like that. They're proving to be pretty fun, disengaging for, or 
um, engaging for folks who, uh, you know, disarming folks who are out there who might otherwise be not willing to talk so often, things like that. But uh, our people have become really passionate really quickly about the issue and, and they think it's, uh, they think it's really fun. And, it, you know, it certainly is. It's something so concrete, something that's um, uh, going to be such a real thing when we get this on the ballot, uh, as opposed to, you know, uh, some tax measure or, you know, uh, you know, something or something or other that may be on there um, that's, uh, you know, less uh, tangible than, than what this is going to be. So uh, everybody, and, you know, I know I'm long winded here, but everybody's really excited on the paid side of things about how this is going. And, um, you know, if we were to run into somebody who, um, you know, w was less interested in, in you know, uh, not, in, not able to engage with folks and, you know, we heard reports and, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, that person wouldn't be working with us for very long. So uh, a long winded way of saying, yeah, we feel really good about how the paid people have uh, you know, taken to the project so far and uh, we're giving them a lot of training on it, so. Excellent, good to hear. I know a lot of folks on this call are, are experts and super passionate and been involved in this for a long time. Yeah. Um, and if you're new, totally okay too. Like you will get the information you need to be able to do this. No. Um, like I said, so next steps after this call, um, we will be sending you an email tomorrow um, with a guide. So that guide has pretty much everything just laid out, pretty detailed how-to steps. The first thing you want to do is sign a volunteer agreement. And that says basically like, hey, I got trained and I understand all these things in the training. And that's required for all signature gatherers. So make I sure to take down on that. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, we're going to want to make sure when we do um, fill this out and submit it um, that we are initialing rather than checking. There's a line for each item saying, I understand this, that, the other thing. And we need them initialed and not checked. It's been something that's come up a bunch already so far. So, so okay. <laughs> good to know. Yeah. I should put a note in the guide on that. Um, as you can tell, what's exciting is like, y'all are getting in on the ground floor of this campaign. It's literally like offices are just opened like within days and the materials just came down. So it's really exciting. It's all new. Um, as we go, your feedback is appreciated to just help us improve your experience as volunteers and the, the boots on the ground for this effort. So please let us know what information you need, what materials you need, what support you need, but we are gonna do our best to support you every step of the way. Um, okay, so you're going to get that email, you're going to get the guide. Um, you can always go to the main website, so bring back the how, the missing howl, bring back the missing howl.org. That has the sign up page, but underneath it, that's where we're going to add resources. We already have the guide linked. We still need to polish up a few things in the guide before we send it out tomorrow, but um, you can take a look at it. We will have images that go there. Um, we're going to actually clean up and post a training video that you can watch or rewatch or share with people to get trained. So anyway, that's going to be kind of our resource hub for, um, for our, our network for this campaign. Um, with that, I, I think that's it. It is customary to end with a howl. So we still have a good group left. Um, Diane, if you can try to unmute as many people as possible here. And you can try unmuting yourself um, if you are on mute. And yes, hello, hello, beautiful people out there. <laughs> okay, excellent. Ready with one, two, and three. Give it your best. Howl. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Fantastic. Y'all are the best. Enjoy the rest of your night. Um, we will be in touch. Take care. Thanks so much, Valerie. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.